It's a pleasure to be with you. I wish I could see you with the, with the lights. You can see me very well. My feeling is that perhaps you are the group that is the most important group at ITB. And why is that? Because we are in a massive change, not only in terms of learning how to use the technology, but we have other huge challenges ahead. How many of you are in the conference business? Could you raise your hands? Incentives? Exhibitions? And uh, what's the other for, for mice? Uh, um, meetings, I guess it was. Somehow, I've been in the, the tourist world because the good Lord decided to send me to Hawaii to be born. And that was ideal. Secondly, how many of you know the concept, the World Cafe? Okay, that was something that I actually started in 1990 and then told, taught to Juanita Brown and David Isaacs. And then uh, Juanita, in her gracious way, wrote her PhD at Fielding University and has spread it through the Peter Singe and other networks. And it really brings people into conversation. And what we're focusing on today is how do we have a much deeper level of conversation within us and between us. But before I go into that, I'd just like to acknowledge Ladies' Day. As you know, this is not just for ladies, this is as much for us men. Because we have to come to terms with it and rethink a lot of the ways we have been. Uh, the, this, this report here, if you put any of these words into Google, it's well worth reading the statement of uh, uh, the Commission on the Status of Women. It's very troubling. They estimated out of a $70 trillion world economy, perhaps $17 trillion is because of our inability to uh, treat women correctly, pay for them what they do in terms of homework and so forth. It was very troubling when I read this. Uh, but. Women are making it big, and this is the head of IBM, and as you've been noticing with the discussions of GM and Opal, the head of GM is also a woman. So there is hope on the horizon. I hope you folks have been studying this, because this is the Agenda 2030, where it really invites us all to think in new ways about the challenges. And certainly, uh, uh, gender equality is there, and that's woven through the whole of the sustainability development goals. So in your conferencing meetings, see if you can't bring that in, if you would. Now, we tend to forget that us humans, if the Big Bang were a year ago, the beginning of the year ago, we're at the last 10 minutes of that whole year. We are very much new on this planet. And if you say, how long could we last on this planet? Forever? Not really, because we know that our sun will last about 10 billion years, and it's 4.7, so another 5 billion years. But because it gets hotter 10% every 1.1 billion years, at some point, water is going to be gone. And it's going to be pretty hard for us to be around with no water. So basically, we're here, and we have this. But that is 500 to 800 million years. Are we using the resources? Are we setting our cities? Are we preparing our education? Are we having our meetings, our exhibitions for the long term rather than just this competitive mentality that we have? How can I under, outdo the other guys? So we have a huge challenge ahead. And so somehow we really need to help one another work together in new ways. Now, <clears throat> growing up in Hawaii, Aikido was just coming from Japan. Does anybody know Aikido here? It's the art of self-defense. And if I asked, um, let's try that. Could you stand up? Okay, um, come over here if you would. Could you hit me in the stomach? Okay, uh, no, let's do it this way because I wanted to. All right, and go ahead, hit me. Okay, typically somebody comes at us and we try to stop him. So come again, and we, we take it that way. But 
That's letting him define the relationship. If he comes in slow motion at me, go ahead, and then I just put my hand like this and take his energy, and I can go with it like that. And then I could put him on the floor if I wanted to, or I could shake his hand. Thank you. Thank you. The idea is, where is the energy in the other? And when I meet a new person, I hardly say anything about myself. I ask them questions. If I had a chance, I would ask each one of you, why are you here? What's on your heart? What do you want to do? And then together, we could do something wonderful. And that's my hope. So ever since I was a young teenager, I've had the Aikido principle. I've also had the Aikido principle because Aikido is, ki is Japanese for energy, like chi in Chinese, or prana, or the best European term I could find is elan vital. I can't find a good term in, in German. What is the really word for energy? Do you have one? Kraft? Oh, but this is neat. It really doesn't do it. So how do you create your meetings, your conferences, your exhibitions to work off the energy of the participants? Now, let me present a little dilemma for you. Do you see any difference between the lady on the left and the same lady on the right? On the left, this was Vienna in the early, the late 1800s. Her husband was a little concerned. She didn't seem so lively. So what was he going to do? Send her to Freud, who was just starting his uh, pro uh, program? No. He invited an artist, Gustava Klimt. And Klimt spent about a year talking with her, and then painted this picture here. Does that picture look like this woman here? Not really. It really looks like the woman she became. How is it that we can develop a vision that people want to grow into? And is that not the challenge of our MICE community? To create our events in such a way that people find that there is more going on within them and between them rather than just another thing to know how to do or to buy. So after uh, seeing this, I find this is our challenge. Now, mice 1.0, mice 4.0. How many of you, in one way or another, already use mice 4.0? Not many. I couldn't find it much in Google, but you'll find certainly industry 4.0, learning 4.0, agriculture 4.0, uh, all of these things, why can't we bring that into our world as well? And it's not just bringing the technology, it's bringing another mindset. So this is really what I'd like to work with you on. How do we go from here to there? And how do, how do you become the Gustav Klimt of the future in your own artistic way? <coughs> so... How might the MICE community play a decisive role in, uh, in co-creating co a wiser future? Is that question okay? It seems that that's what you folks who bring people together in conversation could make a big difference helping us achieve. Yes, the paradigm is shifting. And when we change the way we look, things look differently. How might we make that shift? If you take a step back, you remember Moore's law that the power of the computer every 18 months will double. Why isn't it the power within us is doubling? We somehow, and it was brought out in the previous uh, presentation, go along the old way rather than really understanding that there are all kinds of new possibilities for us to use what's in ourselves in new ways. So this is, you know, Expo 4.0, did find that. Mobility, industry, it's everywhere. But let us give it a deeper meaning. And all of these terms that you're, you're hearing, certainly Internet of Things, big data, blockchain,
do look at that because that's going to change the whole transaction process within our, within our worlds. The digital twin, where we take something in a CAD system, make it in the real life, put sensors on it, and take the information back into the CAD drawing. So we have a digital and an analog version of the same thing. So much is happening at one time. But it's not an easy road because you have the concept of vacu. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. This is what has people scared. And my hunch is that what we see happening in my country and in Europe and elsewhere is people are overwhelmed by all of these factors and they want something that they've known about, that is true, that is simple. And we see that voice, that, that reaction to the whole tidal wave of complexity coming over us. <clears throat> and yet we don't realize that we don't really have a lot of time to make some changes. Honestly, we are being asked within the next 15 to 30 years to fundamentally rethink the very foundation of our global economy. Have humans ever done that before? Never. And yet we are wasting a great deal of time not coming to terms with this. In simple terms, we have a carbon budget of about a, a, a thousand gigatons since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And we've probably used 530, 540 of those. We're putting out about 10 gigatons a year, which means in the next 20 or 30 years, we will cross the two degrees centigrade. And then weather patterns will really start to bite us hard. So there's an urgency, and this is why I was so delighted to share some thoughts with you. Any way that I can help you be more effective in bringing some of these out in your meetings or conferences or exhibitions, be glad to do. And certainly, take a look at MCC, it's here in Berlin, and they have a clock and you can adjust it to the 1.52 and see what's happening there, or put simply carbon budget into Google. <clears throat> and this is what you can see. About 1950, things really took off, so that's 65, 67 years ago. And this is an extraordinary time, and that's what we have to come to terms with. So the three themes that I'm working on in my working with companies, in my teaching and writing are how do we understand digitization? How do we deal with sustainability? And I teach sustainability at the Technical University in Munich. But more especially, how do we go from the, wa the, the smart to the wise? All of our education up until now has really focused us on being smart, knowing how to do things. But knowing what to do, how to do it, how it fits together, understanding complexity, that's where we need wisdom. And I can guarantee that wisdom does not come when you have gray hairs. Uh, it doesn't come automatically, it comes through deep reflection, asking questions, wondering, listening, being humble. So, that's our challenge. Now, <clears throat> to put it in a graphic, we've gone from the hunters and gatherers through the agricultural industrial, and this is where we are, and this is what has people scared, uncertain. Perhaps that's why you have the rise of the nationalistic thinking in many places in the world. But how do we learn to live with that? How do we understand how to talk about that, change our language, and so forth? A huge, big challenge. So, uh, Perhaps it is that we are ignorant of our ignorance. We have a false sense that we know everything. In fact, our whole school system tries to give us the feeling, you must know, otherwise you get punished. But when we say, how ignorant am I? Then I'm open to other ways of thinking. And I must say that in the last few years, I have been actively making an effort to understand Indian culture, Chinese culture, other cultures. And I've been getting out of the, the box of thinking of our Western way 
of uh, thinking, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. So, will we fix our future with our technology or our money, or do we regain a sense of humility and say we are a part of the flow of nature? This is the huge question around the shift that's taking place of our going from the Holocene to now the Anthropocene. Some of you that may have been in Munich know that the Deutsches Museum had an over a, of a year-long presentation on the Anthropocene. So we are in a process of really rethinking our relationship to this whole planet and the systems on it. Uh, now, I've been delighted at this conference to see how much awareness is around sustainability, corporate social responsibility, so I'm really quite hopeful, and I just want to reinforce some of the natural feelings that you may already have in terms of heading in this direction. If you take a step back and say, uh, you can tell whether a, a man is clever by his answers, you can tell whether he is wise by his questions. So the use of questions, powerful questions, curious questions, probing questions, how do you bring those out in your meetings, your conferences, your exhibitions? How do we start to think in new ways? And this is perhaps the big shift that we haven't understood, and I have to pack it in quite quickly. I wish I'd had a little bit more time, but I'll go fairly quickly on this. We tend to see life in terms of space and place. And why is that? That is because our senses are so noisy, our five senses. We're always seeing things, hearing things, feeling about them. And we think mostly that that's all there is, unfortunately. But is that all that there is? And then if you say, how do we think, and you put mind into Google, so often you will see a mind with a bunch of gears you'll notice even that we use the gears here. That is the industrial era. It's not the next mice uh, 4.0. Perhaps we can change that for next year's event. So this is what it often looks like. So how do we go from here to here? <coughs> and yet we don't really know how our brain works in a networked way. And it is because of the dominance of our senses. But if we start to say, could we bring time in, and not clock time, but another time. So what I did is I created uh, this notion here that the past is not back there, the future is not out there. It really is al always here. And my interaction with that is what makes the difference. Yet, because of our senses, we tend to stay in the present we have vague feelings about that and we try to forget this because it was so boring in history class just remembering the numbers and all those things. And yet, I've been looking for another metaphor to see this and I began to say, could it be like the tides? And I put in uh, ocean tides into YouTube and there's some fascinating videos there of how we are washed around and pulled up and down. You'll hear this presentation and that will influence your thinking. You'll hear another presentation, and the same thing will happen. You'll say some things to some friends, and you'll influence them. Perhaps that's a better metaphor. I'm not sure. Let me know if that makes some sense. And it's not just the big tides that take about a 1,000 years to go between oceans. There are all kinds of little tides here and there. So that's really what I'm working on. And how do I, in that quiet center, bring the past and the future into dialogue? Could it be that the tourist industry is not just experiencing beautiful moments in the present, but that we actually go back and experience the past in a meaningful way, like Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts, or Thoreau and, and uh, Walden Pond? Why couldn't we bring that element? Why couldn't you bring that into your conferences? Somehow create that. And why couldn't we be much bolder about thinking about future? possibilities. So, as you might remember, Ibn Haltim was in Egypt. He was confined in a house pretending he was uh, 
um, gone insane because he had been up the Nile and saw that they could dam the Aswan Dam, but they didn't have the tools or technology to do it. And if he came back with the wrong answer to the, the ruler in Egypt, he probably would have been killed. So he was in a house and he started studying light. And he then wrote the standard work on optics and created the camera obscura. What if we create the camera futura in what we do and create events where we basically reflect together about future possibilities that would allow us to live the next 500 to 800 million years? That's where I'm going. So if we look at time, we see space in three dimensions, looks like that, but uh, no, space is in three. But according to Einstein, time is one. Even our dear Einstein didn't see the three-dimensionality of time. So we get caught in the present, and do any of you ever feel any stress? This, this, this whole presentation is guaranteed to be stress-free. So that's because we are so caught there. We don't have the, the foundation to go beyond it. So this is where we are, and we put space between the past and the future, which is wrong. And we basically, if we bring them together, we can see 3D space for place. And what is 3D time? It's insights when we bring the past. And you'll notice when you work with big data, they're not talking about spreadsheet facts. They're talking about insights as you look at the play of different patterns. Little patterns, big patterns, swirling patterns. That's what we're after. Can you bring in the concept of insights into your meetings, your conferences, your exhibitions? <clears throat> Too much here to talk about, but I tried to, to put them together. This is the industrial era that we're leaving. This is the uh, knowledge era. I talked about the interaction of the three, the, the Venn time there. <clears throat> and if anybody gives me <clears throat> your card, I'd be glad to share my slides with you because I really want to help you help one another think the future through. So, coming back to our basic question, how do we create in our events conversations that energize? That's why we did the Aikido. Now you understand. How do we engage in co-creativity? And the word co-creativity has been, been uh, developing since the 80s, What's the best German word for co-creativity? Zusammenarbeit, could be. There's not a good word, is there? The best word I found is Mitgestaltung. But, how, but, but if you don't have a word, how can we talk about it? How can we build it in? So probably, please think of a good German word for this. I find this in most other languages. We tend to use the English for this, I know. So, Many of you have smartphones, do you not? And you have two or three apps on your smartphones, don't you? How about inside yourself? How many apps do you have there? Two, three, eight? Can you name them? Do you use them? We have the best apps already pre-installed, and believe it or not, we also have an internet that weaves them together. How can you build that into your mice world? I'd love to hear from you as to how you're doing that. And that's my challenge there. Now, this is what I do in terms of extending what you've known about the World Cafe. This is my teaching at uh, the Technical University in Munich, where I basically take the class and by a draw of number, put them into groups of four. And I purposely use the number four for the groups if there's a magic number. Go to five or six and one person can dominate. With four, nobody can really dominate because everybody creates the space for one another. And I don't call them teams because I want to get away from the competitive mindset in our teaching. I call them reflective communities where your reflections help your reflections help your reflections. So they take a topic, they create a discovery map around this, and then they share it between one another, and then they look for connections on that. And it's an amazingly energizing process. We could do it 
in our companies and between our companies to find those subtle patterns. Don't just think that algorithms and machine learning are going to solve the day. We need to assert our questions, our values, our thinking on that. And so they then, I put A4 sheets, or no, A2 sheets on the table, A4 along the paper there, and when they see connections, they, they describe the connection and they link it. Everything is linked together, and yet we have an educational system that incredibly fragments everything. And we don't see the interconnections. But when we see the interconnections, we really come alive. We get engaged, and it's so exciting. So, then what's the vision of us as humans? What is it that we humans are called? What's our name? The hint is there. Homo sapiens sapiens. But what does that mean? That means humans wisely wise. But do we even aspire to that? Is that not, is, is uh, Linnaeus not the Gustav Klimp of the future? Is he not calling us to be what we could be? But we tend to get caught here in the greedy, selfish, ignorant. How do we move up to here? How can you create events that help people interact at this level rather than this level? And if you look at it, it's not just in English, but Aristotle already understood that it's not just technique, tec techne for technology, or episteme for epistemology, but it's phronesis. Please note the word phronesis. There's a literature that's been developing around it. It is wise decisions, wise judgment. And if you look in other languages, uh, Sanskrit, tamasic, rajasic, sattvic, it's already there, but we've forgotten it, we've disconnected it. Or in Chinese, and I have students from China and uh, the Middle East and all over, and I ask them to give me these words in their own language, and there it is in Arabic. So we tend to think that my shopping de de defines who I am, and yet it's really the cultural context that makes life interesting, is it not? So how do we go from uh, thinking that we know everything, and this is my friend in... Uh, Vienna that did this, Andreas Bratner, he had a sculpture uh, make this. This here is the known and this is the unknown. Known, unknown, explicit, tacit, objective, subjective. By a raise of hands, do we know about the same as we don't know? Do we know most things and there's just a little bit more that we need to know? Or, do we know just a little bit, and there's an enormous amount that we still need to find out? How many would say A? Raise your hand. B? C? Thank you. But does our educational system, how, how often does a teacher come into class and say, students, this is what I know, but this is what I don't know. Please help me find out. Wouldn't that be wonderful? When you have a meeting, do your speakers say, this is what I know, but this is what I don't know, help me find out. Wouldn't that be interesting? Invite them to do that. Invite your speaker to talk a few minutes, ask questions, and then in your reflective communities, work it over. So, if I put it together, mice 1.0, these are things explaining, rewarding, sharing, and presenting. Familiar enough? Then, if we go to 4.0, what could it be? Could it be exploring the meaning of things? Not just, where's the money? Could it be, how do we find inspiring insets, insights? How do we go to co-creating options, and how do we go to energizing possibilities? Does that feel a little bit comfortable to some of you? Could we work on it? Uh, again, it's a time to reframe the whole mice agenda. So how do we go from our ego system to an ecosystem? Our ego economy to an eco economy? There is a huge shift. 
And I really, from the bottom of my heart, ask all of you, please help us in this journey. We need each and every one of you. And the wonderful thing is that as you get engaged in it, you find a new sense of meaning and purpose because you are working on something much bigger than the money world. So, again, where is mice today and where could it be tomorrow? And could you be the Gustav Klimt? Could you be the uh, inspirer of a wise society, the uh, Carl Linnaeus model. So this is my dream for your future, for our future. Ready to get engaged? Okay, so now we basically go from camera obscura, looking back and gaining things, to camera futura. And you folks become the camera helping under people see things they could never see before. So, in short, MICE 4.0 provides the context to learn to co-create a world that is wiser, and I like the phrase, and I learned it from my students, living lightly, very low carbon, lively, intense culture, and wisely. Why not? Ready to work together on it? Thank you very much.